So this is my story. I grew up in a part of New York City known as Staten Island, which is literally an island that's surrounded by water. And so at a very early age, in some ways you could say I was imprinted on the ocean and on water. And uh, used to go to beaches all the time in the summer, and I learned to swim at a really early age, I just because I absolutely loved the water. And probably it's no mistake that I've ended up working with animals that are found in the water, uh, namely fishes. And I was always fascinated by sound underwater. I remember swimming as a kid, just how cool I thought it was, you know, when you make noise underwater, how you could hear it, you hear other people, things like that. You know, you try to figure out why you're interested in what you're interested in. And I think maybe, you know, early experiences have a big effect on that. When I got, when I got to graduate school, um, the lab I was working in, this is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the lab I was working in, the head professor, was really starting to get into fishes and the nervous system of fishes. So you got to understand, fishes are the largest group of living vertebrates. So vertebrates includes fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, and, and we're a mammal. But fishes are the, have the greatest number of species of all those groups. So they're incredibly diverse. They're in so many different habitats. And so, you know, that began to plug right back into things for me in terms of interest in the water and the ocean. And um, I guess that was sort of my dream in a way, you know, I could study the things I was interested in about the brain and behavior, and then I could potentially study them in, in an aquatic habitat. So it just brought together a lot of things for me, I think. And uh, so here I am at Cornell University, still studying fishes as a faculty member. My goal is, is really to, is to reveal the mechanisms in the brain that allow us not only to make sound in, in terms of producing communication signals, but also to hear those sounds. How do we detect those signals? How do we process those signals? And how do you put the sensation of detecting sound together with the ability to make sound to build a communication system? And that's a big reason, that's a lot of what I'm interested in the lab and what we study. And we study that at many different levels of analysis, whether it's at the behavioral level or down to the molecular level to really reveal all these mechanisms. When you think of the ocean and sound, people mainly think of dolphins and whales. But again, there are many fishes in the ocean that are making sound. And there's one particular group of fishes, they're known as toad fishes. And we study them because they've been well known for their ability to make sound for many years. Uh, there was a lot, the initial big studies of them were really back in the 1950s, in large part because the Navy wanted to know about all the sounds in the ocean. But toadfishes were well known in the popular literature for making very loud sounds. Having students in the lab is absolutely the best possible thing you can ever do. Um, I've had students in my lab ever since I've been at Cornell. That includes undergraduates as well as graduate students. And the thing is, the way I always like to put it is, students really provide the fuel and the energy that really keeps a lab going. So as neurobiologists who use fish as a city system, we tend to think from a more broader and comparative point of view. And to us, humans are primates who are mammals, who are vertebrates. And the fish that we study, the plain fin midshipman fish, are also vertebrates. And when it comes to biological um, building blocks like genes, hormones, and brain regions that control behavior, fish and humans actually have a lot in common. And this includes hormones that regulate, for example, reproductive behavior and physiology in fish. They are shared with um, the same hormones that are regulating reproductive physiology in us. And this includes sex steroid hormones like estrogen and testosterone. Um, in the Bass Lab, everybody's very engaged and passionate about the research that they do. So that's really inspiring as an undergraduate researcher. Um, in my upper level neuro classes, we are assigned to design these hypothetical experiments and I can really draw from my experience in the Bass Lab where I'm implementing and getting exposed to these methods and techniques that I otherwise wouldn't get the chance to do. So that provides a really holistic learning experience that I think is really valuable. Andy is just the best mentor I can ask for. He lets me um, be independent and pursue my own curiosities and questions. At the same time, he's always there to help me and support me whenever I run into a problem. And he um, has a lot of resources to offer me, and he's always there to help me. Yeah. 
there's only so much that you can learn from the classroom and textbooks and lectures and I think that every aspiring researcher, whether you're going to do uh, med school or graduate school, should get the chance to see what it's like to, behind the scenes and get the experience to learn um, all the methods and techniques that gets us where we are today.